Well, we're glad to have Melvin here. I don't know if you need introductions or not, but he comes from Guy's Mills, Pennsylvania, instructor at uh, Faith Builders. Uh, he's impacted my life for almost 20 years now. I think 2000, summer of 2000, mm -hmm. uh -huh. is the first I met him. Um, and I'm excited about the subject this morning, the kingdom of God. So I'd like to pray for you. Lord, we come to you this morning and we thank you for the privilege of being your sons and daughters. Thank you, Lord, for the kingdom that you have designed. It's been your plan from the beginning. And I pray, Lord, that as people from here with ABT go out and spread the gospel of the kingdom to those who have not heard or those who have not understood, I pray that you would catch this vision. And so I just pray for Brother Melvin this morning as he shares. Give him your words to speak. Help us to have hearts that are open. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Brother Matt, for that uh, very kind introduction. So that was the year 2000, many years ago. Brother Joel, question for you. When were you at Faith Builders? 2006 to 2008. 2006 to 2008. It's a special privilege for me to be here. I see a number of students here. Weston, when did I have you? Oh, you were my homeroom teacher when I was in 11th grade. In 11th grade. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> Why do I mention some of these things? Well, I'm not just exactly sure who the primary driver is of ABT, but I know Brother Joel is close to the front line there somewhere. Um, and so 2006, Faith Builders, and uh, lots of discussion there about many things. And uh, Brother Joel, you just, you just will, it'll be hard for you to understand, or maybe you will, how, uh, how much of a deep privilege it is to be here and to see some of the fruit of your labor. I know, not alone, I know there are many others who have contributed here too, uh, very, very much. But uh, it's a, a blessing to an old man, man at least, to see uh, uh, younger men just rise right up and, and uh, take on the challenge. <clears throat> so the kingdom of God, uh, I feel like I'm doing two things today, uh, preaching to the choir and uh, preaching to a choir that I've preached to before. Uh, and, and, and why do I say that? Well, many of you have heard me talk about this subject in various ways at various times and various places. Uh, so forgive me if there is a fair amount of, I don't know, a review, you might say. <clears throat> However, these things are always new. Uh, so I don't really make an apology, but I just recognize that there's a bit of that here in the discussion. I, I want to say, secondly, that I certainly do not take uh, credit for even 90% even 10% of what I am going to be talking about here today. You know, sometimes some of us think we're kind of original, but there really isn't. There's very, very, very little originality, if any. <laughs> uh, we, we hear the gospel, we're, we're, we're taught, we hear others speak uh, and teach and live, and we kind of pick up those pieces and put a couple of them together in various ways. Um, and uh, maybe it sounds new, but it's really not. Uh, so I, give, I could give credit to a lot of different people. Uh, one of my mentors, uh, we didn't know that word years ago. We just called them brothers in the Lord, you know. But uh, one of them was uh, John D. Martin, uh, probably the person who first pushed me along the pathway that I'll be talking to you a little bit about here today. I uh, give him a lot of credit for many of the ideas uh, that uh, we together uh, churned over and worked over so many years ago, it seems, already. Uh, if you take a look at your program, I'm just going to, to outline just a little bit where we're headed here so that you have an idea of how the three sessions tied together. Um, and uh, then we'll launch into to, uh, to this morning's discussion. So uh, today, uh, the message or the, the uh, discussion here is outlined as the kingdom of God. Genesis to Revelation, lid to lid, or as somebody said, from the, lid, front, from the 
front of the lid to the maps. So there's a whole load here to, to work on. But the key issue is the centrality of the kingdom of the scriptures. So it's kind of a general overview uh, that we'll be thinking about, looking at history briefly, uh, and considering some of the issues there. On Wednesday, uh, the gospel of the kingdom from Matthew chapter 16, primary passage that we'll be using there. Um, key issue here, here is how do we preach the gospel? ABT, as I understand it, is focused on translation of the Bible and then sending people out into various parts of the world uh, to bring the word of the Lord uh, to different groups of people. And how is the gospel preached? Um, I'm a history teacher, and you'll hear a little this morning some of the, my concerns about how the, the message of the gospel seems to have changed over the years and the way it's been couched, thought of, and uh, hopefully maybe give you some things to think about there in that message in particular. The third message is building a kingdom culture. And you can see it's focused on discipleship. Um, it probably has been the issue that I have worked on the hardest in the last five years or so, or maybe five to 10 years, uh, a concern of the, for the Christian community. What actually emerges? Uh, what kind of churches are we planting? What's still there 10 years later, 20 years later, 30 years later? Uh, what kind of uh, what kind of longevity, what kind of strength is there? And so we, we, we actually kind of go from, what shall I say, theory, <laughs> uh, this first message kind of setting forth the ideas, second message talking specifically about the gospel, and the third one then, how's it fleshed out? Uh, and very, very common for us, or uh, very typical for us Anabaptists to think in those terms. Yes, thank you, brother, for passing those out. You, you will have a handout here. The first 10 minutes or so here, I will be not working off the sheet that you're getting there, but then we'll, we'll do that here in just a few minutes. I also understand that we'll have a question and answer session here. I, the question part will be fine. I'm not quite sure about how the answers will go, uh, but if I don't have them, uh, they're, well, together, we'll talk about them. So I'd like to begin by just talking about where this burden came from and maybe a story that uh, may help here. Um, I noticed that Alan Roth is one of the advisors here. I mentioned John Martin, and I'll talk just a little bit about Alan. So I'm teaching school at Anchor Christian School. Uh, John has, we, I taught with him for six years and then he moved on and then I taught school with James Landis for a couple of years. And during that time, don't you know that Alan Roth stopped by the, the uh, school because he knew uh, James Landis and uh, he was going to, we stopped midday and had Alan come in and give us a, a, uh, a little devotional. And he told a little piece of his story that I've never forgotten. Uh, he told how he was in Nicaragua and uh, a missionary there and that they had this little pamphlet that they used, the four steps to coming to Christ. And he said, we went from village to village and we would read. Uh, we, did, we had our four steps. And if we were novices, well, we took our little pamphlet with us so that we kind of knew what the four steps were. Uh, and he said, by and by, I got so, I, I came home and I said to my wife, I'm bored. I, no, something, something is not quite the way it ought to be. Why don't I have the fervor behind pre the presentation of the gospel? So he said, I went to the Bible and I began to ask myself, so what did Jesus do? When he went from town to town, preaching and teaching, what did he do and what did he say? And he said, sure enough, I came across this passage that I should have known. Uh, that Jesus went from place to place preaching the kingdom of God. And he said, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. John the Baptist did the same. 
Sal and said, I decided that, you know, tomorrow I'm going to try that. So he said, I got on a bus somewhere. <laughs> uh, I think they were close to Managua or one of the towns there. Uh, so th there were university students oftentimes rode on this bus. So I got on the bus and we traveled down, down, and we were going wherever we were going. I stood up in the front of the bus and I turned around and I said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Amen. And he said, it got deathly silent. <laughs> Not is this? <laughs> Long story short, he said it revolutionized the way I brought the gospel to people. See, there's a difference between saying repent because you're going to hell if you don't, which is a true statement. But there's a difference between that being the core of the gospel and this different well, Jesus approach. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And he said that immediately set me on a different track. And then if you listen to Alan very long, you'll begin to tell you stories of what happened after that. So he said, well, so then what did Jesus do? Well, he sent them out two by two and he said, don't take any script with you and don't take, don't take any money. And, and he, he, can, he starts to tell you story after story about what it started to be like to bring the gospel to people from the kingdom concept. And that really, uh, some of those events or the issues that, began to, that began, uh, began to be revolutionary in my life. Just a piece of my testimony. So you see Sheila sitting here. Uh, and Sheila and I were married at 19. Uh, I, I, in Chambersburg, Pennsylvania. Um, nice community. We liked our church. Uh, and all that, uh, I, I can say with integrity that I was not your classical rebel. Now, we're all rebels. You know, you know that. Uh, do, 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 wanting to do something different than what God wants us to do. But I was not the classic rebel growing up in a Mennonite home who couldn't wait to get out from there and go do whatever. The danger for me was what I became aware of soon after we were married, probably 20, 21 years of age, I, I, I thought, huh. So is this the way life should be? So, so I'm not a rebel wanting to run away from my church. I'm yeah, a reasonable Christian. <laughs> but I began to realize what I really wanted in life, I think. I was flying an airplane. Uh, I was in a little bit of a business of my own as a mechanic, a few things like that. And I, all of a sudden, it struck me that what, what, uh, what my life looked like, where it was headed, is a little bigger business, a little fun flying an airplane. I, I, what I really wanted is I wanted to be a good Mennonite boy with class. <laughs> I, that takes money and a number of other things. I won't go into more details about that, but with that realization, I, I, I said to myself, you know what? I don't think that's going to be a good way to live, and I'm not content with it either. If Christianity is for real, and if the, the claims of the gospel are what I understand them to be, then that's no life. That's, that, that's no way to do it. <laughs> it really calls for everything you have. God knows, and people who know me well, knows that there have been many times I've fell down on that job of giving it everything I've got for the kingdom of God. Uh, but it was from those days forward that uh, my life changed and I ended up in the classroom. Never dreamed of it. Sheila, bless her heart, she was quite sure when she married me, she said, well, before that, she said she was not going to marry a teacher nor a farmer. And now she's stuck with both. Uh, I, I'm, I'm a teacher and I like the farm in the summer. Uh, and there's uh, some reasons for that. But back to the, back to this, to, to the line that I'm wanting to give to you here, the idea. That led me to begin to think about the, the, our concept of salvation itself. Now, uh, some of you have copies of this because you were in my class. Uh, okay, this, this is that long essay on the kingdom of God. Not going to read it to you now. I'm just, just a few excerpts out of here. So, um, the concern of this paper. While the decline of Western civilization is lamentable, a worse and more critical tragedy is the failure of Christianity to set forth a compelling worldview 
that gives direction and inspiration for daily living. Just stop right there. So for daily life, get up in the morning inspired and energized because I'm involved in the work of God what he has called me to do. And for some that is putting the plow in the field and plowing the fields. I have no issue with the various ways in which this has worked out, but it is energizing to know that I am in the work of God, the kingdom of God. The core of that tragedy is not so much that Christians have not convinced the unbelievers, tragic as that may be, the core is of the problem is that our worldview has grown so small that we are in great danger of not convincing our posterity of its truth and even descending into de facto unbelief ourselves. It, see, what I was afraid of when I was about 20 years old, I, I thought, you know what? It looks to me as though I could actually make life work if I just stayed in my business, kept my airplane license, and it just went to church taught a few Sunday school classes, did this or did that. It looks to me as though I actually could live life that way. But I wonder deep within if that might not be something, there might be a, a connection to de facto unbelief. God really will not do what he said he will do. And I was determined to somehow break out of that thing. This da dangerous movement toward de facto unbelief has resulted in the inability of Christianity to stand upon its feet and to move powerfully among the peoples of the world, pointing a way forward for Christianity too, it seems to me, has descended into an array of randomly arranged dots without a big picture, uh, at least not big enough to court the imaginations and dreams of men. The result has been a notable weariness that has descended over the Christian community. And the causes of this suffocated weariness are not worth, are worth examining. And then the statement, the weariness of Christianity is directly related to an improper emphasis on personal salvation at the expense of a major emphasis in the New Testament, namely the kingdom of God. Our big hint here to the core of the New Testament message is in the Lord's Prayer itself. So this made, this point that I just got done making to you is that the main aim of the New Testament is not necessarily to get people saved. Now, careful here. This is going on on record, I know. And it can sound immediately like that's wrong. Okay, hear me out. Uh, it, certainly, the salvation of people is extremely important and and ranks almost first. The reason it is first, though, is because the Lord is building a kingdom. And he's calling people into it. And to be saved is, in fact, to have our sins dealt with and to enter that kingdom. So you do, I don't want you to hear me downplaying the role of salvation, but I want you to hear me that the central theme of the New Testament is not the salvation of man, but the kingdom of God. Uh, where do we pick this up? Well, d d listen to the Lord's Prayer. You met one time the disciples said to Jesus, well, teach us to pray. I said, okay. Now, you would think that if you asked Jesus to now stand up in front of us here and to teach us to pray, uh, he's certainly going to put in that model prayer the issues. Now, the fascinating thing is, is he, he hardly ever even mentions in that prayer the salvation of men. You know it, but I'll just quote it for you. So, um, so if, you're, you're, if you're thinking of the Lord's Prayer, just feel the themes. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Lift up God, thy kingdom come. First out of his mouth. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth, even as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. There you have the peace that calls to salvation. Forgive us our debts. We recognize we're sinners before God. We need salvation. Forgive us our debts as we forgive. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Why? He does not end up because I'm scared to death all these people are going to hell. That is true. 
But he says the real reason is for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And there you see that theme just running through there. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, this morning, we're here. <laughs> we're here not to figure out just precisely what we can do or not do and get by with it and get make it to the pearly gates. Far too much of Christianity, that's, that's the questions they're asking. Oh, it used to irritate me so much. Uh, John Martin and I had a, 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 a prison Bible study together. And there's nobody who can hold out like John Martin can on, on a, a number of these issues. And so, you know, did, I, did John would did, did, did present a, a gospel message there, and it's based on the Lordship of Christ and the Kingdom of God. And you would, an hour of this, somebody raise your hand, the back of the room, they say, why well, go to hell for smoking? <laughs> Yeah, and Brother John and I would look at each other. John would say, that's precisely the wrong question. That's not even the question. It is a question, but it's not the question. Uh, the, the real question is, who in the world is the Lord of your life? And why are you doing the things you're doing? Answer those questions and you'll get to the real core. You'll head toward the core of what Christianity is about. But do you realize that even in our Mennonite circles, we ask, we ask different questions, but we ask them similarly. And we live our lives kind of like that. What can I actually do and get by? That is not Christianity at all. It just isn't. <laughs> Christianity is actually saying, well, God is building a kingdom. And that kingdom that he's building, he's offering it to us. He says in what Matthew 25, um, fear not, little flock. It's the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Do you realize the offer that's being made to us? Have you ever thought about the power of that offer that the kingdom is being offered to us? And he's calling us into it. Now, I hope you heard me right. There's no way to participate there until you deal with the issues that are deal, dealt with in classical salvation. That is coming to the Lord and accepting his atoning work. But more importantly, and I'll get to that in session two tomorrow, uh, to, to accept the fact that he really is Lord of everything. Okay, that's the burden that I begin with here, saying somehow can we look, can we reorient ourselves on the question of salvation and understand that it is a means to an end. It is not an end in and of itself. And the point that I'm point making to you is post-Reformation Christianity has tended to make it into the point. And that is to get saved so you gain the pearly gates and escape hell. It is a point to consider, again, just to make sure that I underlined and make sure that, you, that you, you understand that. But the main point is God is doing the work and he's inviting you and I to be a part of it and say, look, set the record straight. Take care of your sins. <laughs> uh, did, 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 accept the, the atoning work of Jesus and accept him as Lord and come follow me in the work of the kingdom. That's what I hear Jesus say. Now. Uh, the sheet that you have walks you through a few things. I'm picking and choosing here a little bit. But um, if you're preaching or teaching the gospel somewhere in the world, um, it, it, there are bits and pieces of theology that have to be right. <laughs> uh, and we begin with our understanding of the world itself uh, and so that's where I'm beginning here. Now, you, of course, have everything pasted on top of each of, of itself. So the reason there's a white space there, if you care to write, you can. So the linear flow of history, uh, you, probably none of you are working in, uh, in uh, Hindu countries or the, the East. Maybe you are. I don't know. But uh, there, there's the cyclical view of history. Okay, so linear view of history, in really, really short form of that, I am the alpha and omega. I am the beginning and the end. 
There's a beginning point, there's an ending point. It's not circular, it's not cyclical. Uh, and the Bible marks that the beginning is Jesus, the end is Jesus. I am Alpha and Omega. And so uh, that tracks this just a little bit. Um, and what you see then in the block to the left is a creation paradise. Here's the thing about the kingdom of God. It was in the mind of God right from the very beginning. It was not an add-on. Okay? Uh, it seems to me, if I'm reading my Bible anywhere close to accurately, it seems as though Jesus, uh, God, Jesus, a part of that program, uh, created the world, ex nihilo, created the universe. Uh, it, it'd be fun to just explore that, explore that, uh, that creation a bit, but we'll not spend too much time there. He did that, and if we understand that creation week, he brought things together, and he put uh, that sixth day he made man, and he put him on the face of the earth, and he said, take care of these things. This is my kingdom. You are in charge. You are the regent here. Okay, that's the picture we have. Unfortunately, we have the fall. Okay, I'm preaching to the choir, I know. But do you realize how big of an answer this understanding of history offers to the human race? Why are we in the mess we are in? It is not because there was some mistake in the the evolutionary process of genetic stuff coming together. It wasn't that. That was not the problem. The problem is sin. Okay. Now, I said, I'm preaching to the choir. You've heard that so often. I bet it almost went in one ear and went straight out the other. If you're talking to these guys up here at Penn State, I promise you, I promise you, if they don't believe this piece, you're already, you'll have trouble breaking into their consciousness of the problem of sin. If it's just been an evolutionary process that brought us to where we're at, well, nobody's responsible for what you're doing anyway. But the fall, okay? And I know, as I said, I'm preaching to the choir, so it won't take time. Then we move on, and we have the present cosmos, uh, the apocalypse, and here's where I'm going to spend all my time. No, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and I want to be sure that you hear one thing. Jesus is coming again, and there is going to be curtains on this old world. And uh, it's not my job here or responsibility, I don't think, to unpack that. But uh, that's going to happen. And there will be the new heaven and the new earth. I haven't said anything here that the Bible does not back, back up. The kingdom of God is mapped over that entire thing. It was God's intention here to bring his rule, his kingdom, to bear on the face of the earth. We have yet to see just exactly what that will look like. The fall messed it up. A usurper steps in, and we've got a mess on our hands in the present cosmos. There will be a new heaven and a new earth, and God will have his way. The next set of slides, what you see there, uh, what am I out here? God entered the picture there. That's what that piece was about, the present cosmos. Uh, so taking that center piece now and looking at so the flood after the fall, for whatever it's worth in my paper, I argue that after the fall, what we know today or what is presented to us as survival of the fittest, natural selection, et cetera, et cetera, was actually, I think, built into the genetic code by God himself to slow down the deteriorating process. It never was a creative process. If you go up here to Penn State and you talk to the leading biologist on this and you get them by the throat and you say, wait a minute, show me how it is actually has the capacity to create ex nihilo, and they cannot answer that question, okay? I can show you and agree with them that the actual processes, the natural processes that we're familiar with uh, of, of uh, natural selection, et cetera, et cetera, will slow down the process of deterioration genetically, but it won't, it has no power to create. Okay, so make that argument there uh, in that section. Uh, the nation of Israel is created, of course, central is the cross. We should stop here and spend the rest of our time here, obviously.
the resurrection. You can't talk about the cross without talking about the resurrection. And then the kingdom of God. Now, I just got done saying in the slides I had here before that mapped all the way across here is the kingdom of God. But I make this a little bit of a special piece here because I believe that the present expression of the kingdom of God is in the body of Christ, is in the assembled body of believers. I literally believe that. Um, the longing of my heart is to see churches all over the world where God really is having his way. <coughs> And we really see, we actually see his rule at work. We ought to lament the fact that churches go astray. And there are awful things that happen sometimes. We ought to rejoice in the fact when we find a family, a group of people, a church who have really let God have his way uh, in their lives. And, and you see the rule of God there at work. Now, as I already, well, okay, here's just a little bit of a summary. So here's the attack. God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. Uh, and the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Now, forgive me for, I, I have to shuffle some slides around here. There's a little bit of redundancy here, but I think this will work. Uh, so the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world, and they that dwell therein. An interesting thing is that this was a favorite verse of the early Anabaptists. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Uh, one of the reasons they used that passage is they said, well, I, I, these rulers who want to have all this control and manage everything, they don't realize it, but this stuff's all God's. Uh, why do they think they can manage things in this fashion? And they also believed that since this is true, then it's our responsibility to actually exercise the rule of God as we go out here and uh, interact with the, the good earth. But the fall, therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. And here's the centrality of Christ. Uh, I believe this. I, I teach history. When the fullness of time was come, God sent forth the Son. More about that tomorrow, so I'm not going to take more time with it. Here's a couple passages. If we took time to look at all of those, uh, it would just underscore the point that I'm making here, and that is the centrality of Christ in the kingdom of God. I'm not giving it enough space right now. Because if it's central, well, then that's where our, that's where our focus should be at, right? Okay, well, uh, we can look at these passages that confirm right from the very beginning. Until now, eternity past, eternity future. Christ central. Uh, very, very uh, powerful passages here to, to bear that. We'll be looking at Matthew 16 in particular tomorrow. What is the kingdom of God? Here's a little play on words that I like. So uh, the king plus dome, uh, probably... Oh, let's see. Some of you... Uh, I'm among language people here, and so... Uh, Okay, if, I'm, if I get out of orbit here, somebody just get me straightened up here on that. So, so dome, uh, let's see, uh, domestic, doma, uh, home, right? So it's uh, the Latin prefix that gets used all different ways, uh, oft times relating to something that has to do with home, as I said, uh, domestic. And we have various ways in which we use it. So kingdom, where the king is at home. So, so the kingdom of God is present. Uh, and here I have where the king's home is located, or another way of saying it uh, is in the second line that you have there where the king is at home. Um, if I can just quickly say, let's not let this just be pie in the sky, buy and buy stuff. So Sheila and I, it's not like every day we sat down and thought about this, but we would pick our, our, our goal once we got it, <laughs> that the kingdom of heaven is, uh, is all, uh, in, in this idea. So where the king is at home, we said to ourselves, well, how would you actually be a parent? How would you actually run a home? What would you actually do here? If, in fact, what we want is we want the king to be at home here. <laughs> so, in other words, don't let this get too es esoteric out there somewhere where you're, I, we, we know it's true. Ask yourself the question. 
So what am I actually doing in my life? If I have a family, if I'm relating to a wife, if I have children, now I have grandchildren. So there's a king at home. See, he would like to be here. And you know, but some of the questions had become really foolish. Take the internet and its usage and all that stuff. If you really actually entertain the question, so would the king be at home here? It answers some questions rather easily. I know, not all the details. The questions can still get messy. I know that. But the questions about, let's say, maybe the first one is, do you have internet or don't you? Second one is, if you do, how do you use it? Well, if the king is at home, everybody knows you're not going to sit there watch, looking at pornography or something else really, really foolish and ridiculous. Uh, if the king's here, why would you do that? Uh, then you call, it seems to me as though we need to, to actively think about this and culture uh, the attitude. Is the king at home? Uh, this one I'm going to go through here a little bit rapidly because I'd like for you to have some space here to just interact with some of these questions. So two kingdoms, probably Anabaptists have stressed this point more strongly than, uh, than, than other denominations in general. Uh, don't, I want to be fair, there are other denominations that do. Okay, uh, but just saying that this clearly been one. So uh, the first question is authority. The kingdom of God is based on humility and service. Preaching to the choir here. Um, in reality, what does it mean? Jesus said, when you go to a public meeting, don't look for the high seats. Don't try to make yourself important. Uh, just be you. Sometimes just trying to be unimportant is trying to be important. You know that, that, that people do that now and then. It's just, well, it's me. So if I'm called upon to speak, speak. If I'm not, well, do something else. I, I, you know, just, the, the, the issue is be who, who you've been called to be in the situation. Okay, so um, uh, in the kingdom of God, based on humility and service. Now, so I can't help but just tuck this in here. Among uh, Anabaptist historians here just in recent, probably in the last 20 years, there's been a little bit of an emphasis on this movement from uh, uh, being persecuted, the persecuted church to the unpersecuted church, and the attitude change had actually happened. So the, the, the persecuted church created a certain kind of person. Once we came to the new world and persecution kind of disappeared, then what happened? Well, some writers now are saying that we, we adopted the humility motif. Uh, that is the idea that, well, okay, we're not persecuted anymore, but we'll be humble. Uh, and actually, it's not a bad idea. This is, this is a very, very important feature of the kingdom of God. We teach humility. Okay, now I don't want you to go bad places with this. Oh, I, I don't have a degree. Uh, one of the reasons I don't have a degree is specifically this. So, so that's why the world describes a whole lot of greatness. Okay, if you just have the credentials or you just have this or that or the other thing. You didn't hear me say that there's anything wrong with having a credential. That's not my point here. But my point is, if you're humble, what do you care for? It's, just if it happens to be needed or something like that. At least you, that's not the emphasis of your I'm not who I am because I have a degree. I'm who I am because of who I am in Christ. Now that's even true of the person who has a degree. And I want you to understand that. We culture humility. That's a, that's a part of this kingdom, wherever we find ourselves in life. And this, this can be a bit of a challenge. Uh, kingdoms of the, this world, they're based on power and position. This is a time of the year, at least in our area up there, and I see all the signs along the way for uh, local uh, elections and elect this person. I d looked at our, our area shopper where you know you can look to see what's for sale and all that kind of stuff, and two great big pages and two big letters as to why you should elect me. And the other one said the same thing, of course. Uh, you should elect me, and here's all the reasons and all of that. We don't do that. I know I'm preaching to the choir. But I wonder if sometimes maybe we don't get a little confused here based on power in position. God help us if our churches are 
guilty of, I don't know, position mongering or whatever that goes along with that. Uh, I don't know. I, something dramatically wrong there. Means and methods. In the kingdom of God, love that suffers toward redemption. I'm going to be talking about that more on another, I think, tomorrow. Okay, but uh, this one's key. Uh, but I, I don't want to get too far into that because of tomorrow. Faith in redemption and resurrection. I'd like to stop there and talk about this one a little bit. <coughs> A breakthrough for me, I think, on the issue of faith was to realize that there's, there are theological understandings that probably all of us have. Uh, so the death, the resurrection of Jesus and his redemptive work in the world. Okay. Now, it occurred to me that if you really believe that, if you actually really do believe that, that begins to give the, the impetus to actually suffer, be persecuted, even die, because I have confidence in the resurrected Jesus. It's not just a theological point. It's a core, core piece of our faith, our confidence that God will do what he said he would do. God will do what he said he will do. Now, I, you know, you know what it says in, in uh, Hebrews, right? Uh, Abraham, Sarah, he gives that. These all believed. They, they, they had vision. They had all of those things. Uh, but, but it never happened in their lifetime. But they had confidence that God would do it. He will eventually do what he said he would do. Willing obedience to divine command. You know these basic ideas. The kingdoms of this world, in contrast, government by enforced law. Just read a very, very, very interesting article by a, by a, I believe of all, th I think a Hindu, I'm not quite so sure, but somebody from the East anyway, a lady uh, who was talking about the feminist movement uh, and all the stuff that we've been up against here in the Western world, and not a Christian at all, uh, but saying, I, if you have to enforce your feminism by law, and she was thinking, uh, pointing fingers at the Western world and how, you know, the Me Too thing and a whole list of things like that. Some correctives needed there for sure. But if it's got to be done by law, this lady said something wrong with it. It'll fail. It actually won't accomplish your, the, the end. It'll end up binding you up over here somewhere. Where, so you thought you were being loosened here by law. But if you did it by law, you can be sure it's going to catch you over here somewhere else and backhand you when you're not, you didn't know it was coming. Uh, and, and I thought it was really fascinating. A non-Christian Eastern lady saying that this was the issue. So government by enforced law, but that's the way they know how to do it. If there's a problem, fix it by law. And, once, and if you, once you get the law in place, find a way to enforce it. That's the way they do. Competition and greed. You know, a capitalism, I, I, I don't have an issue with capitalism. I have an issue with competition and greed, wherever it is, and however it's exercised. I, you know, I, should, I don't want to go, go into a, a lament, but there is something wrong if we, as a plain people, are known to, to cut hard deals when we have our black hat on or whatever we have on. There's something dramatically wrong. That's the way the world does. Okay, competition and greed. So, okay, so we, we need to push back against that hard, violent coercion, fear. I have some stuff there on, on uh, from Berceau, David Berceau, friend of ours, and I'm sure many of you know him well. Uh, writes a book. I would recommend it to you uh, if you haven't read it uh, on the kingdom of God. And he gives a number of things here. Uh, let's see, five principles in them. Boy, where do I have all of these? Get my papers right here. I, I'm not going to talk about all of these. Just mention them and move on. So God is in ultimate control of the kingdoms of the world. Daniel affirming that. All earthly rulers derive their power from God. I know we don't know what to do with that sometimes. 
uh, but it's, it's true. Romans 13, 1, John 9, 9 to 11. God's oversight of earthly kingdoms is separate and distinct from his governance over, uh, of his governments of his kingdom, the church. John 18 points that out. If you want to ask some questions later on about those, you may. I'm wanting to move along. Four and five, all earthly kingdoms are temporary. I do want to just push the pause button there. Brothers and sisters, again, if we believe what we say we believe, it ought to really give us great comfort. Do you realize the only organization on the face of the earth today, as I'm speaking to you, that transcends both time and eternity is the church? One day when that occurred to me was one of those days when I said to myself, you know what? If there's any organization on the face of the earth that deserves my time and energy, and it is worth my time and energy, it's the church. And when I'm preaching to my students at school, you might have heard this before, I say to them, now, 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 wait a minute, when you're thinking about this, don't think about those godly brothers in China. Put yourself in your own church, right where you're at. Put yourself in your home church, sitting beside the people that some of them you kind of like and some of them you kind of don't like personally or whatever and just rem and just remind yourself i am sitting among the people who are constituting the only organization on the face of the earth the only one not gm not ibm not the united states of america none of those the only one i'm sitting among that group who actually is going to transcend time and eternity. You tell me then why we wouldn't want to belong there with all of our hearts. I said to myself, well, if that's true, let me in. I want in. <laughs> I want to be a part of that group that actually is going to, when it's curtains, they're still there. And not only that, but they're the bride, it says. I, I have issues with the anti-church notions. I just have to tell you that I really have issues with it. It's like, what are we thinking? <laughs> uh, why not get in there and be a big time part of it and, and, and uh, do what we can in the kingdom of God? Verso says all earthly kingdoms are temporary. I agree. <clears throat> Five, Satan has considerable influence, control over the kingdoms of this world. And again, we struggle to know how the sovereignty of God works. Uh, in, in conjunction with that, I, I can't answer that question any better than you can. But it's, it's true. God is sovereign, but we still see the devil at work. Okay? <clears throat> or so gives us a little more. We are aliens, that is, strangers and pilgrims living in pagan nations. Now, I want to just push the pause button here, too. We are... You should never forget something. As an historian, at least, I've discovered this. We are a product of our times. Now, as much as you may want to escape that, it's, it's just true. We're a product of, the, of our times. You and I ask the questions that rich men historically have asked. Why do I say that? Well, you realize that in most of history, Almost nobody would have had the opportunity to actually get an airplane, get a visa, uh, fly to some part of the world and go there and learn a language and teach that thing. Do you know that, Weston? You're a rare guy. Why are you so rare? Why, why is this group so rare? You're a product of your times. The persecuted church, your ancestors, my ancestors, did not ask the same questions you're asking. To them, when you talked about stranger and pilgrim, that was clear. They knew exactly what you meant. <laughs> uh, to be a stranger to pilgrim meant that you were not Catholic. <laughs> you, 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 you took your babies, mind, and you did not baptize them. And you, you might lose your life for it. Do you realize how life-changing that would be for you how many babies are around here? If all these little children around here, if in fact, if an authority walked over the edge of that bank right there, and in this congregation, in this group of people here, there were children who had not been baptized in the church, and you could go to jail for it. Do you see how you would feel like, I mean, that stranger pilgrim question is not hardly a question. But for us, uh-oh. We live where there's, we call it freedom, we call all of these, and it's true. 
and we've got money in our back pockets and we can do we can buy clothes and we can do things that even kings could not do 200 years ago 300 years ago and, and so we're, we're at, we, we ask some of the dumbest questions ever honestly we do how much should you pair, pay for a pair of shoes I, I'm not going to stick my neck out with that one. <laughs> but I know one thing, you know, when my sons went off to buy a $120 pair of shoes for playing basketball, I said, what? You know, what are we thinking? Would the persecuted church have ever asked that question? Don't hear me chucking too many stones here because I've got the same issues that you've got on this. My point is don't ever forget you are a product of your times. And you think about things that people in other generations did not think about. Uh, and, and you're faced with questions, and particularly a very, very wealthy free society has presented you with options galore. So many options so that we could, uh, it, you know, if you had grown up a Russian peasant or a serf back in 1630 or something like that, you didn't ask the question, well, I wonder where I'm going to live. You grew up there because you were already bound to that land. That was already determined. 90% of the questions that you have needed to answer, they didn't have to answer. They were there. You're a product of your times. And I'm, I just want to say I'm glad to be living when I live. <coughs> we all should embrace our times and then ask ourselves the question, but what does it mean to live like a stranger and a pilgrim? Call it separation if you want to. What does it mean to actually live counterculturally today? Uh, that's a question I've asked myself a lot of times. And I know one thing, I, I don't have any issue with our plain way of life. In fact, I embrace it. Okay? But I know one thing, it's far more than just dressing plain. Countercultural is in every area of life entertaining the question. What does it mean to, to live under the Lordship of Christ? in this area, whether it's economical, whether it's how I plow the ground, whether it's what car I buy, whether it's uh, whatever, dead name the question. And answering it, oh, oh, and by the way, I always say that if you follow Abraham's little thing there in uh, Hebrews thir uh, chapter 11, 13 and 14, so he had vision and, and then he was convicted and then he, then, then he was moved and then he packed his bags and he left. And then I'm sure everybody in Ur of Chaldees said, you hear about that crazy guy down, the neighbor down there? He's nuts. <laughs> the guy, you know what he's doing? He said, he said he's moving. I asked him where he's going. He said, he has no clue. He just, he just, he, well, he's looking for a city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. That's crazy. <laughs> well, my point is, if you're really following God, you don't have to make yourself a stranger and pilgrim. You're weird right from the get-go. Uh, your ideas are just nuts. They're, they just don't fit <laughs> with general society. So you don't have to, you don't have to arm twist people being into strangers and pilgrims who are kingdom people. They are different. Their citizenship is somewhere else. Uh, we are called to subject ourselves to our host government, but to uh, uh, yeah, yeah. But to embrace our first allegiance to the kingdom of God. Again, I know you know that. More about that tomorrow. There will be an inevitable clash of values and goals. And Jesus comments, you render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, to God the things that are God. And we are called to respect and honor for government. These are coming from Berceau. Many of you, I'm sure, have already read that text. If you haven't, I'd recommend it to you. Here's a model. Kingdom of the world, it's not cow. <laughs> kingdom of the world, kingdom of God. Here's the area that we're concerned about. And that we struggle to, that overlap. What do we do with the areas that overlap? And I'm not here to answer all of those questions, uh, but maybe just to give a few things to think about, so it's already on your paper there. We are aliens here. Um, but we live with respect and honor. And you know, again, you can tell, my concern is, well, what does it feel like when, when rubber hits the road? So we live in the times that we live in. My neighbor, George Salsgiver, is a 72-year-old, 73 maybe now, I'm not sure, Vietnam War vet. 
um, I had a very, very interesting conversation with him early on. So we're aliens, and one of the places that we really feel that is when we have, we take the position of non-military involvement, et cetera, and here's a man, George has about 26 feet or so, now I'm, I'm stretching, I forget how many feet, a good many, a number, he told me before, the number of feet of plastic, because, in his stomach, because when, or in his intestines, because when he was driving a truck or when he was in Vietnam, he ran over a booby trap and it blew up and, and all that. Okay, so here, I, here's this man sitting who, for love or duty to his country or whatever, has given, has really given up a huge section of his life. I mean, he's suffered terribly. Here I am, his neighbor. I'm a teacher. I don't go to war. Now, I have a question. How do you relate here? What do you say to a man like this? <laughs> if I may say this kindly, such people deserve respect and honor. Here's what I said to him. Early on, I said, George, let's talk about something. <laughs> I know you're a Vietnam War vet, and I grew up in the same era you did. I'm actually young enough, though I was never drafted. Okay, but uh, they grew up in the same era. You went off, and here you sat, you're tore up pretty badly. Now, I didn't ask him to comment on this, but I said, I realize that you and I see things differently. So I just want to tell you something. I respect people who will give their life for what they believe in. Okay, so you need to know I'm not sitting here thinking you're an idiot. Okay, I respect people who will put their life on the line for what they believe in. The difference between you and I is I do not believe in the United States of America in the same way you do. I appreciate it. I intend to be a good citizen. I intend to, I intend to, to give my what I can to make this a good place to be. I intend to pay my taxes. I didn't say all of this, but this was the, 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 the sense of it. I, I, I hope to raise children who will never be on the welfare program unless they have to be for some reason. I hope they will all be contributors. I intend to do something for this nation. But I do not believe in it at the level I'm going to give my life for. It. But I respect people who will give their lives they, for what they believe. I'm giving my life for what I believe. Uh, what I believe is that, that uh, the Lord calls us to a life of service. I was amazed. George actually received that. He said, I understand. Now, he's a Catholic, and so he, did, he has a bit of a background. And I, I, I made this, the, my speech much bigger than what I actually gave to him, but that was the essence of it, uh, and, and, uh, and talked to him about it. That's what I mean by being stranger and pilgrim. This is my position. This is what I believe. This is what I'm giving my life to. Jesus is Lord. Calls me to that. Can we respect people? Uh, you didn't hear me say stamp of approval. That's not my point. But respect to people who give their lives to whatever. They, they, they seriously give what they've got to what they think is, is the right thing. That's not a full answer, but that's kind of the idea. Allegiance and loyalty is always the question. That is always the basic, that's when it gets right down to it, that's the question. How does this apply to today? Two minutes here and I'll, I'll quit. The, the plastic in your back pocket. I suppose most of you have credit cards or something of some kind, okay? Uh, you know, some of us are old enough when they first started coming out, mark of the beast. Yeah, and a number of other things attached to it. You didn't hear me say that it doesn't have a piece there. Well, I've been telling my students for years, you know what? That piece of plastic is as innocent as the air you breathe until it becomes an issue of allegiance and loyalty. And I fully expect after generation after generation of generation have been trained in the use of such things and so forth and so on, the day will likely come that there will be some question attached to that piece of plastic 
or any other piece of plastic, whether it, uh, it's a license or a visa or whatever it is, that may well ask you to make a statement on your allegiance and then you better be awake. Uh, we better be practicing now. Who's in charge and is my life aligned there? Okay, that's, that's a question in my mind. So are we always aware there. And finally here, we are called to reconciliation and redemption. That's our work. We are called into the work of Christ, which is reconciliation. That's in this area right here. So back to George. If I have a bit of a regret, he's still living. Uh, he was on his deathbed, well, I don't know, a couple of times, right? She at least have felt to us. And, uh, you know, I ask him, so George, oh, yeah, that's, it's fine. He, he's, he's Catholic. You know, a guy on his, is on his deathbed, you're not quite sure how to break into that. And, and I left it lay there, not sure if I should have. But we're called to reconciliation, to redemption. And, and in the nitty gritty pieces of life is my point here. Let's not just let the kingdom of God be some big, nice thing we talk about. How does it work? Reconcilers. Moving the property line the neighbor's direction onto his property if you need to uh, for reconciliation, for redemption. You've heard stories like this. I'm going to stop there for today. It's 12 o'clock, and I'll turn the time back to Bryant.